、えー、皆様こんにちは。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.、Uh, thank you for attending our seminar hosted by JIA. Today、uh, we have a very, very special guest speakers, and、uh, we are going to have a panel discussion with them. As far as the topic is concerned, we have informed you already it's、uh, North Korea and nuclear issue and the Japan US alliance. Needless for me to say anything uh, uh, uncalled for until、uh, autumn、uh, two years ago. Uh, the missiles flew、uh, close to Japan, and nuclear experiments、uh, tests were being conducted. But last year, the、uh, situation changed earlier last year. So, the wind, uh, uh, direction of the wind shifted,、uh, the, the Christian Pyeongchang, and also the symmetry between the two Koreas, which took place three times、uh, during last year. And also in June of last year, as we clearly remember, Uh, there was a summit meeting、uh, in Singapore between、uh, President of the United States and uh, 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 North Korea. And Kim Jong un、uh, visited China four times up to January of this year.、Uh, so I would say that very much spectacular events have been happening uh, over uh, the peninsula or concerning the peninsula. And、uh, in the meantime,、uh, as far as the nuclear、uh, issue of North Korea is concerned, denuclearization, the core of the problem, at least、uh, the information I received is uh, that uh, substantially uh, there has、uh, been no major progress、uh, that we can identify, particularly with regard to verification and also before that、uh, the reporting of the facilities. Or declaration of the facilities, no agreement、uh, seems to have、uh, taken place, at least according to some.、Uh, so, this being the situation, Japan, United States, and also I would further say Japan, US, and South Korea. Between us,、uh, collaboration and coordination is important, but、uh, how do we fare now, and what's the direction that we should be pursuing? In these arrangements, and also, what about the presence of China?、Uh, given China's presence, what would be our approach to accommodate that、uh, country's presence? So, we have、uh, four very special speakers to discuss these important issues today. And I'll just be brief in introducing them. To my right is、uh, Douglas Powell, as you very well know, he is with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace、uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s. He was uh, uh, occupied important positions uh, uh, with the NSC of the United States.、And、then to his right is we have、uh, Ambassador Joseph Yun, who is the senior advisor of the USIP. And 2018, he was a special representative for North Korean policy. And be before that, he was with the State、uh, Department、uh, for a long period of time,、uh, occupying very important positions、uh, relative to Asia. And then uh, we have uh, General uh, Osamu Onoda, who was the commander of the Western uh, Jazz Staff, uh, which has a very close、uh, shall say, relationship with the、uh, Korean Peninsula. But、uh, he was a commander、uh, when he retired of the、uh, Air Training Command. He is currently with the Japan uh, uh, Policy Research Institute. And then we have、uh, Tetsuo Kotani,、uh, who is a、uh, uh, senior fellow of JIR.、Uh, his expertise is in security matters. So, with that,、uh, okay, we would like to give each speaker about 10 minutes for initial remarks. So, firstly,、uh, Mr. Paul, please. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Ambassador Nakayama. And thank you all for coming today, including many wonderful old friends in the audience. It's so great to see you here.、Um, I, uh, all of us have to take out a different part of the conversation for this afternoon. And I will leave to my colleague, Ambassador Zhou Yun,、uh, a lot to talk about in terms of bilateral U.S. North Korean relations, which I know will be of interest to people who are following. 
the potential uh, state or, or um, summit meeting between Kim Jong-un and President Trump and the preceding meetings before that. Uh, I thought I would introduce some background discussion because I came here with a view to the regional role of China and the Korean issues. And uh, the uh, point I would like to make at the outset uh, is to note that in the time since Kim Jong-un came to power almost seven years ago, uh, the U.S., excuse me, China and North Korea really were very much estranged in their relationship. Uh, I think many of you will recall that in the early uh, accretion of power by Kim Jong-un, he had to remove rival sources of power in the North Korean regime left over from his father and grandfather. And one of the famous incidents early on in his time in, in power was the uh, uh, trial and execution of his uncle, Jang Sung Tech, uh, and many of the members of the family connected to Jang Sung Tech. He was an uncle by marriage to his father's sister. And he had, over many years, taken increasing control over China's relations with North Korea. And uh, some people would say it was a source of corrupt funds because he controlled the trade in coal and other products that went from China to North Korea and the incoming products from China into North Korea. Uh, he also represented a political connection to the Chinese leadership. <laughs> and the early uh, execution and removal of Jiang Sung Tech and his influence, uh, I think for China, reminded them of a much earlier purge by Kim Jong-un's grandfather, Kim Il-sung, who had purged the pro-China faction in the, the DPRK leadership 25 years earlier. And so the new leader in China, uh, Xi Jinping, was looking at the new and much younger leader in North Korea and seeing someone who was trying to diminish Chinese influence. And during that period, uh, Kim Jong-un very rapidly developed North Korea's nuclear weapons capability and its uh, increasing long-range missile capabilities to develop not only sh short-range, medium-range to reach Japan and uh, inter intercontinental-range missiles to reach the United States with weapons that were increasingly powerful and frequently tested under Kim Jong-un. For China, this introduced yet another problem, which was that North Korea was becoming a source of security instability in the Northeast Asia region, where China had not felt challenged uh, significantly previously. And there was considerable uh, popular unhappiness and worry in Northeast China about the nuclear testing in North Korea, which was so close to the Chinese border and near uh, sensitive volcanic uh, mountains that could be presumably disturbed or caused to erupt or produce earthquakes uh, inside Chinese territory while they're testing North Korean weapons. So China had a number of levels of concern. And China was willing in that period, up until uh, early 2017, to join in United Nations Security Council resolutions that put the most severe sanctions on North Korea that we've ever seen. Uh, this added to the estrangement between Beijing and Pyongyang. And um, one of the things that was done by China that I always thought was a very substantial sanction, although it never received the attention as a formal sanction, was Kim Jong-un never made a ritual trip to, to Beijing. He was kept in isolation. He was kept in a lower status. He had not been received by the leaders of the communist movement in China. But with the arrival of Donald Trump in the US and uh, a very erratic swing in American policy toward North Korea from initially very belligerent, strong language, famous in the phrase fire and fury that would be rained down on North Korea in the uh, summer of uh, 2017, uh, to the willingness to take part in, in uh, direct symmetry with North Korea that followed 
less than uh, seven, eight months later. Well, I, I, Joe Yoon and I can talk later on the question of how Moon Jae-in, as the president of South Korea, took advantage of the Winter Olympics at Pyeongchang to uh, initiate inter-Korean diplomacy, which began the transformation of the process. And I won't go into detail on that, but just note that that inter-Korean diplomacy and Trump's own effort to have personal diplomacy with Kim Jong-un gave new life to Chinese-North Korean relations. Up to that point, China had the relationship of estrangement that I mentioned a moment ago. And with South Korea, China was putting large numbers of informal sanctions on South Korea uh, over the deployment of THAAD anti-missile systems in, in the South to defend against North Korean missile capabilities, but which China thought would also be advantageous against Chinese missile capabilities as well. And so China was in the bad position in the end of 2016 of having de deteriorating relations with both North Korea and South Korea. But the inter-Korean diplomacy of President Moon Jae-in and the symmetry of Donald Trump has changed the situation in ways that I don't think anyone expected. And we now see China moving its influence back into both North Korea and South Korea in ways that was not the case beforehand. And so we, when we talk about inter-Korean diplomacy or we talk about U.S.-North Korean diplomacy or Japan's own ambitions to restrain North Korean military threats and to deal with other problems in the relationship, increasingly China is going to be a factor after many years of being off to one side. So North Korea's leader followed his, pattern, his father's pattern in when the first Kim Jong-il inter-Korean summit was to take place, Kim Jong-il had not visited China for six years. But on the eve of his meeting with uh, the South Korean leader, he made an, an unusual trip to Beijing and uh, met with then uh, Jiang Zemin, the party general secretary, and tried to restore relations so that when he subsequently Kim Jong-il met with his South Korean counterpart, he would look less isolated and more supported from, uh, from China. The, the, those two countries having a traditional, though not very active, military alliance even today. Um, and we saw that in this 2017 period, Kim Jong-il, uh, his pattern was seized by his son, Kim Jong-un. And he, after six years of not visiting China while in power, made a trip to Beijing where he was received in, as far as I can tell, precisely the same protocol fashion that his father had been received uh, back in the late 1990s. So we're seeing a, um, something both traditional and something new in China's reassertion of its interests in the region and something that will complicate the outcome of various kinds of uh, agreements that may follow from the upcoming summits. Now, we've just seen in the last uh, month, Kim Jong-un has completed his fourth summit with the Chinese leaders. And, the, and we understand from North Korean media that Xi Jinping has accepted an invitation in principle now to attend, to, to visit North Korea as a leader of the Chinese Communist Party and therefore will be raising the level of North Korea and Chinese relations, again, as part of this process that helps Kim Jong-un approach his meeting with uh, Donald Trump with greater international support from China. So those are my introductory remarks on this subject and look forward to questions after the others have a chance to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Powell, for a very, your very concise uh, commentary uh, that uh, fit uh, your overview exactly into the con uh, 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 aspect of the discussion that we're having today. Next is Ambassador Yun, please. Thank you very much, and uh, very much thanks to my Japanese hosts uh, for having us here. It's been a delightful two days. 
and my delegation leader, Mr. Paul, for including me, you know. Um, so I do want to talk about, we talked a lot about uh, recent development and where are we in regard to U.S.-North Korea relations, what will happen, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, and what can we expect if we do go ahead and have the second summit. All indications are that there will be another Kim Jong-un Trump meeting very soon. Uh, you saw that, number one, both Kim Jong-un and Trump want the summit. They very much want the summit. And both of them see plus for them politically uh, in having a summit. I think the most clearest signal was, as uh, Mr. Powell said, given by Kim Jong-un going to Beijing some 10 days ago uh, to essentially to get Xi Jinping's permission to have the summit, a green light from Xi Jinping. And uh, as you know, this is the fourth meeting between Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping, and they've all taken place in China. I think that speaks volumes about the relationship, hierarchical relationship between North Korea and China, and really the assertion of Xi Jinping that nothing gets resolved in North Korea without me. You know, I think that's the clearest signal we're seeing from China. Um, the second signal is that we now expect perhaps even this week, there to be uh, 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 you know, a level below U.S.-North uh, uh, US Korea meeting. Perhaps the rumor has it that Kim Young-chul is coming to Washington. And, of course, uh, his, uh, the vice foreign minister, Che sun -hee, is on a wait, apparently, to Stockholm. So all these are signs that they're preparing a summit. And uh, my own guess is that it typically takes about six to eight weeks to prepare a summit like this. And so I think we can expect a second meeting between Kim Jong-un and, uh, and, and Trump probably before the end of the first quarter, that's the end of March. Uh, that would be my own guess. Um, I mean, second, I think a lot of people are interested in where is the summit going to be. I think there are two factors at work here. Number one is that Kim Jong-un needs support, logistic support. So he would want to be somewhere where there is a DPRK embassy. And, uh, and so that's, a, that's a first factor. Second factor is that um, I don't think he wants to borrow a plane from the Chinese again, you know. Uh, it kind of crimps his style a little bit, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think he would want to go where his plane can reach. And I think that ideally for him, he wants to do it in Pyongyang, but President Trump doesn't want to go to Pyongyang. And so I think he, he said, uh, you know, perhaps Mongolia, that's kind of cold and logistically <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, and so, you know, that leaves places in Southeast Asia or Singapore, we've done it, you know, uh, maybe Hanoi, Bangkok. But again, you know, if he borrows a plane, he can go many places. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, you're going to have to have, you know, typically these meetings involve logistics, you know, dates and, uh, and formats. But of course, for us, you know, for you, for us watching this, what is important is substance. Will they make progress? Will they make progress on what U.S. wants? that is denuclearization. Will they make progress what on Kim Jong-un wants, which is some kind of economic improvement, uh, such as lifting sanctions, as well as getting more his security demand, you know? So those are the things that, uh, that are needed. And I would say that to many people, Singapore was a disappointment in the sense that there was no concrete agreements on steps to denuclearization. But there is always, on the other hand, on the other hand, I do believe that Singapore accomplishment was that tensions were reduced. I mean, who can deny that we're better off now than 12 months ago? 
You know, I mean, in Japan, you don't have missile bits falling all over. You know, I mean, when I was uh, in my work as the special representative for North Korea policy, I would come here often to meet my counterpart. And of course, it was on, he was under tremendous pressure because missile bits were falling around Sea of Japan. And, uh, and, you know, and, and so you don't have that anymore. So it's definitely tensions are reduced. And for me, it is hard to see that we will go back to the same level of tensions as we had then. Uh, however, there has not been significant steps towards denuclearization. And so I think that was the problem of Singapore, that it left nothing in terms of process. What are the second steps? What is the roadmap? So I do think that if the second summit is to be successful, they have to address those two. What are the next steps and, and, and uh, where is the roadmap? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, again, in order for that to be done, there has to be pre-negotiation. There has to be working level negotiations, cabinet level negotiations, on this is what we agree before the summit. They have to have a draft communique in which these things, steps towards denuclearization, uh, is pointed. I mean, if I may say, you know, I mean, in my view, elements of deal are there. You know, I mean, there's no question elements of the deal are there in the sense that uh, uh, clearly what North Korea wants, above all, is some sanctions relief. And Kim Jong-un has made it quite clear in his uh, January address that he would like to see Kaesong Industrial Complex returned. He would like to see Mount Kumgang Tours returned. And he's also hinted at what he could give up. He said he could dismantle Yongbyon, that's their declared nuclear facilities, and that he was also prepared to freeze uh, nuclear weapons production, nuclear fissile material, material production. So I think all those are elements of a deal, but in order for there, for, for us to see these deals in place, there has to be a process a step-by-step -step process that will get us at least those positive steps towards denuclearization. So with that, thank you very much, Nakayama-san. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, more than uh, the moderator expected, all the speakers are uh, mindful of the uh, punctuality. Mr. Onoda, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will speak in Japanese. As the Yoon gave us the comments, which had a lot of contents. Uh, since yesterday, you know, from 2009 to 2008, uh, there were uh, six party dialogues. I'm going to go back to those times. We were asking, I was asking uh, this question, and the answer was given today. Uh, there are various elements, so uh, the only way to go is to go step by step. I mean, if you think about it, last year, at the time of the Olympics in Pyongyang, Kim Jong-un turned to a peace offensive, and now it's been about one year since then. It's a half joke, but Olympic Games contributed to such a huge political uh, turnaround, probably for the first time in history. But then again, the current situation after one year is such that uh, no substantive progress has been made in denuclearization. Actually, it's uh, stalling. But uh, there is an Olympic Games in, uh, in Tokyo in 2020, so there should be no concern. And after that, uh, the two Koreas uh, will form a joint team, come to Japan. Uh, so that will be the Olympics, will be the opportunity to talk about denuclearization. Then there will be another stall. But then again, in 2022, there's a Winter Olympics in Beijing. So slowly but gradually, things will evolve. Is a half a joke hope of mine that I have. But. Uh, Returning more seriously to my discussion, this uh, the six-party talks. Are we going to go back to those times? I mean, there is a suspicion for that. And remembering what we did uh, in 2003 or so, 
there were some substantive moves made, and at the end, North Korea uh, in 2008 stepped out of this. It took five years for them to step out, and the very last stages in 2008, uh, DPRK, uh, as far as the monitoring and verification mechanisms, they did agree to these mechanisms. But then there were some things that happened, and uh, due to lack of trust, they decided to step out of the six-party talks, and thereafter, as we know, they turned to, uh, to um, uh, more offensive actions, taking tests, uh, nuclear tests, as well as flying missiles. So what's the lesson we can learn from this? Uh, this is another question I threw to uh, Ambassador Yun yesterday. Uh, I mean, if you look at the negotiation between the United States and North Korea, the nuclear uh, weaponry that North Korea has, all the facilities, uh, they want to uh, see the list of those on the table, which is denied, of course, by North Korea. Back in 2008, actually, similar uh, things happened, similar situation happened back then, and uh, never did North Korea uh, cross that line, because for North Korea, abandoning of the nuclear is the abandoning of the uh, security uh, for all themselves. And so that's the situation we have to remember. Because, uh, and it's been 15 years or so since that time, but uh, at the time, uh, if the conventional weaponry of South Korea and the United States and uh, 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 North Korea's conventional arms, currently the gap is so very wide so for Kim Jong and for DPRK, a nuclear weaponry is a weapons or methods of last resort. Uh, last resort method. So it would be very hard for him to give up on this. Personally, I would think they will never, Kim Jong would agree to uh, getting rid of this last resort because the U.S. troops, even if U.S. troops go out of the peninsula, would that be a guarantee of their system? There's still uh, troops of the United States in Japan, even without uh, uh, Japanese U.S. troops, U.S. troops in Japan. Uh, U.S. has a uh, capability to attack North Korea with long-range uh, weapon rates, so there's no absolute guarantee for their survival politically. So given this situation, what can we do uh, to convince North Korea uh, to give up uh, nuclear weapons? It's going to take a huge amount of time, and it has to be done in a step-by-step -step mode uh, or manner. As far as Japan is concerned, uh, given this situation, Japan-U.S. alliance uh, is going to be significant, very important. The significance is being now much higher than 20 or uh, 15 years ago. And uh, if something happens, the U.S. and Japan forces, Japanese forces, uh, should join their forces in operation, not to attack North Korea as such, but uh, for Japan's defense. There should be even closer coordination uh, or tie-up between Japan and the United States troops uh, for operational purposes. That has to be, that has to be the case. And from my experience, I would say that uh, at the t compared to the six-party talks days, the current Japan-U.S. alliance, in particular, military aspect of that alliance, is much more close. And uh, the fact that it's much more close means that uh, if something happens. Uh, it could serve as a stronger deterrence. So at the end of the day, if, uh, by the way, this is something that cannot, Japan cannot accept, if uh, North Korea decides not to abandon nuclear forces, then we have to find out ways to deter us against that. Uh, for Japan, it's going to be very difficult, but uh, 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 Japan has to depend on that alliance. And in the recently announced uh, midterm defense plans and uh, defense uh, program outline, uh, they re uh, refer to these points uh, precisely. And also, another point I'd like to make is about China factor. China. Xi Jinping did very well taming uh, Kim Jong un, uh, in good communication with Kim Jong un. So between China and North Korea, the relationship has been established uh, well in the last year. But uh, uh, I'm concerned about the U.S.-China relationship, which is deteriorating, the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, two years ago in December, the United States introduced the security strategy and also defense strategy. You know, 
uh, changed them uh, in a major way and decided to call uh, uh, Russia and uh, China as an uh, uh, enemy. Uh, so in that situation, Japan's position is uh, very much delicate because you could say that uh, we are an ally, therefore. They see China as a competitor, so Japan should also look at China as a competitor, Americans would argue. But that is an option that is very difficult for Japan to take. Uh, likewise, for Korea, it's difficult because uh, geographically we're very close to that country and we do have a trading relationship or cultural historical relationships uh, uh, to exist. So uh, the American request would not be an option that it's wise for Japan to take. So the alliance between Japan and the United States must be strengthened. But the basic basic direction in terms of the roles to be played by Japan and the United States, we have to recognize that uh, roles to be played by two parties are now different than before. Uh, so um, uh, handling that situation, driving that through, is very difficult. Uh, so we have to be focused not on North Korea, but as we face China's uh, rise, it's difficult. If North Korea uh, uh, well, China's uh, uh, support, China's power is indispensable for North Korea, uh, and the United States uh, would have to compete against China, but also borrow China's support. As far as we are concerned, we have to do very well, very carefully, so that uh, we will be in this uh, scheme of things, not have to fight against uh, China. North Korea uh, wants to do both uh, economic development and the uh, nuclear development. The Byungjan line, which they uh, abandoned uh, last year, the Kim Jong-un clearly stated that now they're going to go for economic expansion, but up until then, they were going for two ways. And we have to also take uh, both hedging and engagement by uh, options uh, open to us, keep those options options. That's uh, where we stand in terms of the alliance between Japan and the States, and it's a situation that's going to loom large in the days ahead. Thank you. So the role to be played by the U.S.-Japan alliance was uh, one of the points you mentioned. Thank you. Now, uh, Professor Kotani. Hi. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. My name is Kotani from JIIA. Allow me to talk about uh, the uh, movement, recent movement of the U.S. and North Korea and uh, how it affects uh, the Japan-U.S. alliance and uh, U.S.-South uh, uh, Korean alliance. Uh, in the beginning of this year, Kim Jong-un announced a New Year uh, statement and he mentioned four no's. Four no's means no more production of nuclear weapons, no more testing, no use of nuclear weapons and no proliferation. Those are the four no's he mentioned. And uh, he calls on Mr. Trump to have dialogue. And if the U.S. doesn't uh, respond, he said he will seek for another route. For uh, the last few days, as uh, Ambassador Yoon said, the second uh, summit between the U.S. and the uh, North uh, may be coming in several weeks' time. From my sources in Washington, most likely in uh, uh, Vietnam, whether it will be in Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh, it's being debated. Kim Jong-un, when he announced for no's, well, what can we learn from his statement? To start with, uh, this time last year, when we talked about the denuclearization of North Korea, CVID was the word complete, verifiable, irreversible uh, denuclearization. However, we no longer use CVID. That means we it receded uh, to a large extent in this regard. But instead, uh, uh, we talk about the complete denuclearization of the peninsula between North and the South and between the U.S. and North Korea. CVID ends the uh, uh, denuclearization of the peninsula, two totally different things. CVID means completely denuclearize North Korea, but uh, the uh, peninsula's uh, uh, com uh, denuclearization means that uh, Removing the U.S. nuclear umbrella from North uh, from Korea. North Korea wants to avoid CVID. At the same time, 
this uh, U.S. nuclear umbrella, well, North Korea wants that umbrella to be weakened. As uh, uh, Mr. Onoda said, uh, well, we know about the six-party talks at that time. Uh, instead of uh, giving up all uh, the nuclear development, uh, we will assist North Korea. That was the deal. But when we look at the U.S. and North uh, process, there's a difference. North Korea is not likely to give up all the nuclear uh, program. ICBM, with the ability to attack the U.S. mainland, North Korea, instead of uh, uh, in, in place of uh, giving it up, uh, uh, North Korea wants to get the uh, assistance, so uh, uh, lift the sanctions. Uh, the North Korea, from time to time, says about themselves that the North is a responsible nuclear possessive country. It uh, means not only not using the nuclear uh, weapons, but uh, to uh, also contribute to the non-proliferation. That is to say, uh, what they're saying is that please uh, uh, admit that we are the nuclear uh, uh, possessing uh, country, but we will not proliferate. Uh, I think uh, North Korea is looking at India as a model. India is not participating in NPT and has nuclear uh, 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 capabilities, and U.S. condones that. But so most likely, North Korea wants to be an in India. But uh, uh, North Korea had the experience of proliferation in the past, so it, it would be, it will end up in, as a Pakistani model, uh, which complicates this uh, issue. That's the Trump factor. Most likely, President Trump himself is not interested so much in the details of the nuclear denuclearization of North Korea. If the test is not being done, that's fine with them. From North Korea, that is a wonderful chance, chance in a million years. So uh, Trump came to the power, and North Korea wants the dialogue with Trump. If the president is Trump, but North Korea believes that he, they can have the deal to get more. And that's why they went into this peace initiative. So, denuclearization, the future direction, we cannot be too optimistic. As Ambassador Yoon said, uh, there's a detente, to be sure, yes. And detente, how is it going to uh, turn into uh, the uh, declaration at the end of war? Uh, Korean War, that's a possibility. And beyond that declaration, peace treaty may arise. And then beyond that, more comprehensive uh, peace regime may emerge in uh, the Korean Peninsula or Northeast Asia. From the turn to uh, peace regime, the transition itself is not bad. But if it is a unilateral uh, pace that North Korea or China wants, then what will happen to the U.S. forces in South Korea already? Mr. Trump himself uh, says that it costs too much money to have uh, U.S. forces in South Korea, and if possible, he would like to withdraw. And for uh, Mr. Trump, alliance is investment. It should uh, have the return on investment. Uh, with the U.S. forces in South Korea, uh, North Korea expanded its nuclear capability so far. So for Mr. Trump, uh, U.S.-South uh, Korean alliance is a, a non-performing asset. And between U.S. and South Korea, uh, there's a discussion of the transition of the operational control of wartime. If there's a contingency, uh, U.S. forces will have this operational control over South Korean forces. But by 2022... Uh, Moon Jae-in wants to uh, have the transition of this uh, operational control back to uh, South Korea. Furthermore, uh, the joint military exercise has been suspended for several uh, uh, months uh, uh, between U.S. and South Korea, and U.S. forces is lacking in QRC in September. 
there was this military uh, pact uh, agreed on between South and North uh, around the DMZ. Uh, several activities have been restricted, and then with this, uh, uh, there's an uh, evisceration, uh, 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 the hamstrung uh, uh, on part of the U.S. forces in South Korea. So some move may happen in this regard. Uh, the defense budget of this year for U.S. up until 22,000. There's a uh, clause not to go lower than 22,000. Now it's 28,000, but uh, the law says it shouldn't go lower than 22,000. There's a condition. The, with the approval of the Defense Secretary, uh, it can go down uh, below 22,000. If Mr. Mattis was there, he will never agree to go lower than 22,000, but uh, 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 Secretary Mattis is gone, and Acting Secretary uh, Mr. Shanahan relatively is obedient to Mr. Trump. So if Mr. Trump says to Shanahan, uh, orders him uh, to go lower than 22,000, that can happen. Mr. Carter, during the 70s, tries to raise the number of the U.S. forces in South Korea, but the military and the Congress and Korea, South Korea and Japan all opposed. But uh, the exit of Syria, which everybody uh, opposed uh, so vehemently, now started. So with mis if Mr. Trump sets to go lower uh, in the U.S. forces in South Korea, it may happen. So what would uh, be the impact on Japan and Japan-U.S. Uh, alliance if the North Korea remains to be nuclear power? Then. If it doesn't have the ICBM, it cannot attack the mainland of U.S. And let's say if North Korea attacks Japan, then the U.S. doesn't have to worry about being attacked by North Korea. And then U.S. can uh, attack uh, North Korea to defend Japan. So uh, we, this will not immediately weaken the Japan-U.S. Uh, uh, alliance, uh, uh, decoupling of Japan and uh, U.S. interests. But if the United States uh, uh, focuses only on the long-range missiles but uh, condones uh, short- to mid-range missiles, that's a psychological effect, uh, adverse effect psychologically then Japan-U.S. alliance's confidence may be uh, undermined. We need to be mindful of that. If the U.S. forces in the South Korea will be reduced or withdrawn, then who will benefit the most? China. For one thing, in the uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, the military uh, uh, clout of uh, China will be larger, and in the peninsula, uh, along the border, China has uh, many U.S. For, uh, s sorry, uh, military forces. If the peninsula uh, will become under the influence of China uh, in other areas like ECS, SCS, China will be more hawkish. That's a possibility. So the withdrawal of the U.S. forces in uh, the uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, that can have an impact on the, the military balance, or security balance in Northeast Asia. If that happens, there are, uh, there are some good things as well. There's a possibility that the Japan-U.S. alliance will be strengthened because those withdrawn from South Korea, uh, the roles and functions uh, can be uh, uh, carried uh, uh, by uh, the U.S. forces in Japan. Uh, the commander of the U.S. forces in Japan, as an exception, have this uh, operational control. Oh, no. The U.S. commander in Korea have the operational control. Uh, the uh, U.S. commander in Japan doesn't have it. But uh, if the alliance is strengthened, maybe the U.S. Uh, commander in Japan may have the operational control. There's a, a plus uh, in that. Another thing is 
What will happen to the U.S. and uh, North Korean uh, 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 relationship if there's a deterrent? That can be a plus for a solution of the abduction issue, which is a, a very big one for uh, Japan. So uh, it's not that uh, we uh, expect only negative things, but there are positive things as well. But we need to closely monitor the movements of both the U.S. and North Korea to think what Japan should uh, do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have about 45 minutes left. But before we open the floor for your questions, uh, the panelists on the Japan side talked about the importance of the alliance, Japan-U.S., and also relationship between Japan and South Korea, or relationship among Japan, U.S., and South Korea. And they so gave us context about the future uh, uh, um, course of the cooperation. Now, from the U.S. Uh, panelists, I'd like to invite your views uh, going forward about uh, uh, the this alliance between Japan, U.S., or Japan, U.S., and Korea going forward. What do you think will happen in the days ahead? Mr. Powell, first. Obviously, we are in a, a testing period where um, – Japanese observers will watch very closely to see whether um, Japan's security interests are properly uh, weighed and uh, attended to in any outcome from the conversations between Trump and, and Kim. Um, if I were Japan, I would be very strongly representing myself, and I know your ambassador in Washington and his team at the embassy are strongly representing themselves. Uh, at the White House and elsewhere in the U.S. government. Um, whether the president in the final analysis will be listening carefully is, is a question we all have and uh, can't answer independent of this. But in the absence of, the, or it, before a decision is reached, it's important that those of us who are concerned about the health of the U.S.-Japan alliance and about not permitting North Korea, in this case with, I think, strong Chinese support, from dividing the interests of the various allies. Uh, we in the United States generally, I think the U.S. government continuously uh, hopes for increasing U.S., Japan, and South Korean uh, consensus and cooperation in a host of areas, despite the difficulties that have been taking place between Japan and South Korea. When it comes to the big issues of peace and war, we have to know that there's a bottom line that we need to cooperate in very fundamental ways. And uh, a great many people will be uh, pressing to make sure that we accomplish these right objectives. But as our colleagues here mentioned, Mr. Trump has indicated a variety of priorities. Uh, one has to hope that, as Ambassador Yoon pointed out, um, in the end, we will see a general reduction in tensions and the beginning of a process to dismantle North Korea's ability to threaten not just the United States, but also to threaten with weapons of mass destruction Japan and South Korea. That We need to keep that broad, uh, important goal in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is no question, but there is tremendous support in America for the alliance, for both with South Korea and with Japan. In my mind, it gets overwhelming support, and there is a strong recognition that these alliances, Japanese support them, South Koreans support them. So I don't think there is any fundamental reason to question support for alliance. And so in that sense, I do think, uh, you know, uh, Kotatani's concerns are a little bit, may I say, exaggerated, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, for example, of course, you're always going to have tense negotiations on what we call host nation support or SMA. I mean, it's about money, you know. You want the other guy to pay more money, and that's always going to happen, and there's no question. The issue of OPCON, operation control, that's in South Korea, it's been there for the past 
10, 15 years. Remember, he was going to revert back. He was first asked by uh, President Nomuyan, and then he was canceled, postponed, and now there is a plan to do it by 2020. If I was a betting man, I would say it's not going to happen in 2020 either. The conditions are not right. So really, given, I mean, the most important thing is politicians react to public opinion and votes. There is tremendous support, I would say, on the both sides of the Pacific, on the alliance, and I think they, there's been a great exaggeration that this system is weakening. Thank you. Yun, thank you, Ambassador Yun. Uh, now, the panelists on the Japanese side, if you have any additional comments you'd like to make, this is the time. Uh, Mr. Kotani, no? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kotani. 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 We have an exemplary uh, group of panelists uh, who have left us with 35 minutes or so. So time allowing, we'd like to proceed uh, with the questions and answers. Yes, Ambassador Hori. Uh, today's uh, discussion is our presentation is very interesting. Before uh, Nakayama-san asked Paul and uh, Yun, to uh, say something. I, I wanted to uh, ask a question to Joseph about the, uh, your line of thought, is which is quite diff not quite, very much different from Kotani-san's presentation. But uh, when, when the general public in Japan think about the, uh, you know, uh, President Trump uh, cares much less about the, uh, his own alliances today, and uh, he's dealing things, diplomatic things, and uh, very touchy, uh, delicate uh, problems from the very business mind uh, like, uh, you know, uh, attitude. And uh, he, what he's thinking about is only to get the uh, support of his constituency and to maintain them and to bring back the good gifts for them to reward. And uh, unfortunately, his constituency cares not much about the denuclearization, which we, we want to achieve. And uh, Joseph said the, uh, you know, denuclearization is a very, very basic, important point, even though we don't say C C CVID. And uh, that is what we, we are aiming at. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, people are rumoring about the uh, Trump could say, could, could, could make a very a political stunt of the devil dared uh, action of uh, agreeing the, uh, what shall I say, uh, agreeing to the only, what shall I say, agreeing to uh, dismantle the economic sanctions with only the freezing of the uh, current situation of uh, nuclear uh, weapon, uh, you know, uh, programs of uh, North Korea. Or we hope that the, uh, even ICBM, it has to be dismantled, not the only the freeze, but the uh, easy uh, deal uh, President Trump could do it, and no one can 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 stop it. But uh, I wonder, uh, Joseph can say that the Pompeo could be a good stopgap, or Bolton could be. And you yourself has already broke with Trump, and uh, I think the overwhelming support for the U.S.-Japan cooperation. But we doubt it today. And uh, what do you do? You mean overwhelming support? Maybe within the only the uh, states, uh, you know, uh, you know, defense or the uh, secretary of a uh, state, and therefore your entourage. Maybe the overwhelming support for the U.S. Japan, but the uh, general public today already divided into two, and one half will care uh, not much about the uh, uh, supporting Japan or defending Japan any longer. So I'd like to ask Joseph, uh, are, you already, are you still inside of the uh, uh, State Department and you can influence them or you are just speaking outside of it? And uh, if the uh, Bolton or the uh, Pompeo uh, could be a very good uh, safeguard of them or do we need the uh, Xi Jinping to come into? Uh, that is my question. Thank you. That's a tough question, Ambassador. <laughs> Horia, you know, uh, you know, we, we're old friends going back to our Malaysia days. So, so, you know, I hope your golf's improved, by the way. You know? <laughs> um, I think, I think, obviously, the threat level you feel in Japan 
is very different from what we feel in the United States. I mean, that's, that's very true. And is much more immediate, much nearer to you than, is, than us. But again, you know, I, to me, the scenarios that are being painted is very, very far-fetched that somehow U.S. will trade in ICBMs and ignore nuclear weapons, uh, IRBMs, other missile capabilities. To me, that would be such dereliction of duty. It would be completely alien to uh, everything that, has, that U.S. has stood for. Now, Ambassador Horia, if you're questioning that Trump himself is very much questioning what has stood for. I would say the institutions, including Congress, including the military, including the professional diplomats, I would say these are very formidable institutions. So there is a definitely a line. And I do believe that this line will hold. Ambassador Horia, you did not ask me, but I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to offer an illustration of what Ambassador Yun just said. American presidents come and go, but American interests persist. And I think some people in this room will remember that in 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected. And his explicit campaign promise was to remove the American alliance from South Korea. And he, he fully pledged to do that during the dictatorship of President Park Chung-hee in, in South Korea. But the interests of the United States prevailed, and he was persuaded over time that it was not going to help the human rights situation in South Korea to put it in a position to be overwhelmed by the system that was prevailing in North Korea. And the American interests prevailed over the president's wishes. And I think that's the point that Ambassador Yoon was just making. Thank you very much. I should have uh, uh, said earlier, if you have any questions, please wait for the microphone uh, before you start asking questions. Yes, please. Thank you for your talk. I am Ben Yeshim from Iran Embassy, Scientific Attaché. Uh, my comment is that if you keep yourself in place of the king, uh, facing a government which came out from an agreement 5 plus 1 with Iran, which for uh, more than 12 years there was discussed. You think that the Kim will uh, go up to, and he's taking time to pass the Trump uh, presidency. Thank you. Uh, whom you want to ask that question? Uh, anybody. Okay. <laughs> I, I think the Iran case is a very valid case. But let me tell you my experience with dealing with North Koreans. They do not compare themselves with Iran. They feel they're way more advanced in their nuclear and missile programs than Iran. And this is where I do agree very much with uh, Kotani-san. They're not going to, they don't think, they, they believe they will, won't have to denuclearize anytime soon. And so they believe that they will not reach the kind of agreement that Iran did with the United States. Now, remember that Iran's agreement with the U.S. was about 2,000 pages. The last significant agreement between U.S. and, you know, six-party talks was, uh, what was, what, 2005, I think? It was page and a half. So we're talking materially different cases. There is no way we can reach the detailed uh, agreement that Iran uh, agreement had with North Korea. Thank you. Uh, next question. Ambassador Yu and Mr. Powell. I'm very glad to hear institution, American interests are far greater than President himself. But I still have a little bit concern about if there is any fundamental change in American society, namely 
after Trump, young and much more sophisticated Trump may appear. In other words, new nationalism may appear. On the other hand, among Democrats or leftists, socialism may appear. So I'm afraid there seems to be a divide in the American society. How does it influence on your foreign policy, particularly the Korean uh, Peninsula, um, U.S. forces in the Korean Peninsula, and so on? That's my first question. Second question is, if there is any f also fundamental change among South Korean people, particularly Moon Jae-in regime, he seems to be much more sympathetic with North Korea. They seem to put more emphasis on rapprochement or post-future unification of the Korean Peninsula rather than CVID or decolonialization and so on. This is in line with Kim Il-sung. Only when Korean people, both in South or North, have strong nuclear weapons, Korean people can be really independent without any great power's influence. Such an idea, I, mean, I don't know if it's true or not, may seem to spread among Korean people, even in the South. That's my concern about it. So how do you look upon the Korean people's uh, mind at, on these days? Thank you very much. Well, there are several uh, aspects of the long question you asked that could be addressed separately. On the, I would start by saying that in South Korea, um, there's a lot of sentiment among young people uh, in South Korea, but it is not a sentiment moving in the direction of unification with the North or following the lead of the North. It's quite the opposite. And if you look at the polling data for the current government, which, if you remember, came to power when the conservative uh, dominant uh, government collapsed for other reasons. Uh, they came to power and they exploited North-South diplomacy to political advantage, but are now suffering in the polls for fear that they're not functioning effectively to provide the kind of prosperous economy that young Koreans are looking for. And I don't think they're looking for that prosperous economy to come from North Korea. They see it somewhat quite differently. And they're also, these young people are also concerned about a second aspect of what your question raises in my mind, which is um, in, in, in these governments, policies swing on pendulums. In democracies, at least, that's the way it is. This policy will produce a reaction to that policy, and then we go back again. But, but interests continue to prevail. And if you look at Mr. Trump and his interests, the older or younger, uh, the rise of socialists or not, the unmistakable fact is that China is rising as a power in this part of the world, is increasingly challenging us. And the, the Korean Peninsula question, while important in its own right, I think will be properly viewed as a component of the great power co a competition that we're now entering into. We've, we've departed from the fixed axes of the Cold War. We went through a period of unilateral American domination. That period is now over, and we have to make adjustments to a new balance of power arrangement that we haven't really seen since the early 19th century or maybe just after World War II. Uh, and the major patterns of behavior are going to be changed by this emergence of Chinese power and assertiveness in the region. And I think that um, uh, these, these matters of, of Korean politics will seem very small when compared to the need for all of us to protect ourselves from growing Chinese influence. Absolutely. So I very much agree with uh, Mr. Powell, uh, and uh, on, on both account, on broader narrative on American foreign policy, how we adjust, we need to adjust, and, uh, and, and it will happen. On Korean issues, you know, I'm a Korean-American, of course, uh, and, uh, and there is no question that, you know, Kim Jong-un, everyone used to think of him as a little overweight with bad haircut, you know? But now there is a different impression that he's on a global stage, he conducts well, he speaks surprisingly well, 
and he's meeting Trump, Xi Jinping, Moon Jae-in, you know, as, as, as in reasonable manner. However, and this is big however, to imagine that even the most progressive element in South Korea are prepared to live under Kim Jong-un, that's a complete mistake. That is a complete mistake to imagine any significant population in South Korea are prepared to live under Kim Jong-un. And, and that, that, that is a very important point in my view, you know. So there is nationalism and you hear often in South Korea, even progressives breaking into two camps, so so-called sovereignty camp and the other one being the alliance camp, alliance with the U.S. alliance. Sovereignty camp, of course, being nationalist, they want self-determination and so on. And that is understandable, but to imagine that they would welcome, to, they would want to live under Kim Jong-un is a complete mistake. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's a next question, please. Uh, I should have uh, mentioned earlier, please identify yourself, your name and your affiliation. Zia Masaota with Kyoto News. Two questions. Might be a stupid question. One for Mr. Yoon. Uh, you didn't mention the possibility, any possibility regarding the, uh, you know, North Korea give up nuclear weapons. Do you think, uh, is there any uh, even slightest possibility that the uh, Kim Jong won't give up the uh, nuclear weapons? If so, what kind of, you know, condition? What will be a minimum requirement for us? I mean, the U.S., South Korea, and the Japan side. Second question would go to uh, Mr. Parr. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive explanation about the original, you know, strategic uh, landscape. Uh, Missile defense review would come up, I think, pretty soon. And the uh, premise of the uh, missile defense in this region is the, uh, you know, targeting the uh, rogue regime, North Korea, Iran. This is the uh, long prem premise of the uh, missile defense policy. But according to a most recent report, new missile defense review might target China and also Russia. That might be a fundamental change of the missile defense policy. If so, what would be a strategic implication toward this region, especially what would be a, you know, a impact on the strategic, strategic stability, especially between the United States and China in the future? That's my question. Thank you very much. Ms. Ambassador Yun, could you respond first? Uh, thank you very much. Do I think uh, North Korea will ever give up nuclear weapons? I mean, it's hard to say ever, <laughs> you know? I mean, I do believe that if Kim Jong-un or whoever the North Korean leader is 100% satisfied that the regime will survive without nuclear weapons, then he will give up. Will he ever be 100% satisfied? I don't think so. On, <clears throat> on the missile defense review, um, I, I don't focus so much on this review. I think that's a minor feature. Um, I would look more intently at the recent announcement of the United States of its intention to leave the INF Treaty, which I think is a reflection of the, of the reality that Russia has been, uh, in effect, preparing to violate the treaty in a substantial way. They allege the U.S. was doing the same. And while the US, Russia and the United States have restrained themselves in the agreement since the 1980s, China has been building capabilities that are quite formidable in the region. And the, the INF Treaty does not address those. And so I think you'll see much more emphasis on developing capabilities uh, with respect to each other's uh, nuclear forces that may in time lead to a point where the cost of adding more missile inventory will be such that the U.S. and China and maybe Russia would be interested in re-entering into arms control talks. Um, but my personal judgment is we're a long way from that, that the cost of uh, uh, nuclear weapons and uh, missile modernization is not so burdensome to the parties concerned that they feel they have to make adjustments in their policies right now. Um, 
this is this indirectly your question points to a real concern which is we have truly insufficient understanding of Chinese nuclear doctrine and uh, both of us and the Russians too are now engaging in highly capable conventional uh, long-range power projection capabilities both bombers and missiles and high and hyper missiles um, that could affect the strategic stability by attacking nuclear capabilities with non-nuclear weapons and so this is adding additional instability to the process and should in time lead all the parties to want to reach some kind of agreement on arms control but I think we're a very great distance from getting to that point in my opinion Thank you. Next question. Kamoto. Nice to see you again. Uh, uh, I, I have a question to Dr. Power. Uh, you said uh, for the United States, China is much more important than the Korean situation. So may I ask you the, what is your prospect for the U.S.-China trade war? You are United States will raise the tax rate, tariff rate, or what, what would be asked about? Thank you. Well, thank you for asking that question. I would first uh, say on the, um, the, the U.S. will be, in my view, the U.S. would be wise to try to steer North and South Korea toward a more comfortable relationship and with Japan as well because – the Korean Peninsula should have a natural interest in having an outside power to balance with against the overwhelming power that China presents on their northern border. So in the long term, there should be some coming together, uh, not to diminish the current threat, but to look at the long-term possibilities. On the trade negotiations, um, I believe China really wants a deal on those things which are not systematic, such as how they develop their science and technology, how they develop their state industries. But when it comes to terms of trade, opening markets for services, uh, purchasing more grain and fuel and uh, maybe semiconductors and other things from the U.S., uh, China is probably building to be very accommodating. Um, in a sense, when at Buenos Aires, Xi Jinping agreed to talks with Trump before March 1st on the trade issues. Um, he did not ask the U.S. to lift the tariffs that are already in place. Um, I've never known the Chinese not to want to return to a neutral starting point before they would discuss. To me, this is an admission of guilt, and so that we're not by China that they were not operating their market fairly, and now we're in a plea bargain as to what a price should be or the penalty should be for China for getting back into conformity largely with the rules of the WTO. So I think there's the possibility of a trade agreement on market access, uh, the trade deficit adjustment through state-directed purchases, uh, through opening financial services in some areas, increasing the share of ownership permitted in China, and maybe reducing some tariffs. Um, but I think that will be only a partial agreement. More important will be below that level at the strategic and systemic competition level, uh, China will continue to seek competitive advantages, which the U.S. feels are threatening to its position in the world. And the issue will shift after the superficial trade agreement to the more underlying Cold War type competition between the two systems. And this, I think, will capture Taiwan and China excuse me, capture Taiwan, South Korean, and very importantly, Japanese interests, because the U.S. will be seeking to place export controls on high-tech uh, 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 high exports of intermediate and finished goods to China. And that will capture a lot of Japanese exporters, Korean exporters, and Taiwan exporters in the high-tech industries. So you may see a passing reference in market relaxation over a superficial trade agreement, but you should keep your eye on the underlying strategic competition that will follow. Thank you very much. I see another hand. Yu Kobayashi from NHK Japanese Public Broadcaster. Um, 
Uh, now, the, you know, Mr. Jung uh, said that uh, we need a you know, negotiation step by step, but now the North Korea seems to refuse any steps of the working level talks. And uh, so they just want to direct it with uh, Mr. President, uh, President uh, Trump. And uh, the Trump he thinks himself as uh, you know, tough negotiators. So both of them, you know, uh, wants to give the least and take the biggest. So what will be happen if the, those two guys talk in the second summit meeting? What is supposed to be the best scenario and the worst scenario you heard? And if you have the uh, Onodo-san, Kotani-san has a comment, please, I want to know that. Uh, I completely agree with you that uh, uh, North Korea wants to deal directly with uh, Trump. And that's a problem, you know. I mean, that is a problem in the sense that, you, you know, it's unpredictable. You, you know, you, don't, you do not want your boss to go into a meeting where he's going to be hit with a request and you, you don't know how he's going to respond. So I would say that uh, if this happened again in the second summit, that there was no pre-arrangement on what the results were, then it would be undesirable, whatever was agreed on, because there has to be a degree of consensus on those who will be responsible for implementing the agreement that this is achievable and both sides agree. Uh, Mr. Kotani, at the Singapore summit, there are advantages and disadvantages for U.S. and North Korea. Uh, both are top-down uh, uh, countries, and if two leaders, top leaders, uh, uh, meet, uh, um, things will start to move. But if even if the top decides, top leaders decide on something. It does not guarantee that these uh, agreements will be implemented in respective countries. U.S. Uh, president has uh, more constraints than uh, North uh, Koreans' leaders. Kim Jong-un. Well, the country is governed by a workers' party, and if, even if Kim Jong-un says that he will denuclearize, there will be opposition inside the country. The top leaders' agreement will not solve everything. May are you satisfied? Yes, please. Next one. Uh, hi, um, I'm Kohei Tsuji from uh, Semi NHK Japanese Public Broadcast. I have a question to Ambassador Yoon and Mr. Paul. That uh, my question is: if there is any change in the attitude of the United States toward the uh, North Korean threat, given the um, dramatic change in the presence of China in international uh, political arena. Um, you have mentioned that Xi Jinping has a very strong grip on North Korea. And Kotani-san also mentioned uh, China might uh, increase its influence on the Korean Peninsula if uh, something happens to U.S. forces in, in Korea. And given that, you know, we are living in completely different age from, for example, 10 years ago, six party talks, given that China's presence is so much bigger and it's, it is the number one uh, security concern to the United States. So given those uh, changes, uh, would there be any change in attitude of US government to how to deal, how to handle this North Korean nuclear threat? Thank you. Well, that's a very important question. And uh, my own view dealing with China on these issues, as well as observing their behavior, is the first point is denuclearization of North Korea is also very important to them. I disagree with many people who say they don't value denuclearization highly. They just don't agree with how the U.S. does it. You know, they would want to do it their own way, which is, of course, much slower. And that's not to say there is nothing higher than denuclearization. I think they value even higher 
stability on the Korean Peninsula and the continued buffer zone that there has to be between U.S. troop presence and, and their own mainland. Uh, given that, I do believe it is crucial for China to be bought into any agreement that we have with North Korea. And, and China has made it abundantly clear that they will be part of any settlement. So I think in that sense, they're not going to be left out, and there is nothing U.S. can do about it. So U.S. has instead tried to elicit uh, Chinese help. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, insightful uh, presentations. And my name is Hiroshi Sugimoto, freelance journalist. I would appreciate you know, if you could tell us how you see the likelihood that the, the Mr. Trump will raise the issue of the, you know, the withdrawal or reduction of the U.S. forces from Korea. I was a little bit you know, provoked by the Kotani-san's presentations. You know. Well, uh, is it likely for him to, you know, uh, express you know, his desire to reduce the U.S. FK uh, in an upcoming summit meeting? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we don't know. We've just watched this episode with this, this very small force in Syria which was announced to be withdrawn and then not to be withdrawn. And then we've just announced an increase in troops in Qatar, which, where you would think we would be reducing troops at this point. So it's very hard to get a consistent signal out of the administration. It's plain that Trump does not value troop, uh, troop deployments as much as other presidents have. But it's also plain to me, when I talk to members of the Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, that they are very, uh, in fact, almost to a person. They've been visiting the forces in South Korea. They visit their soldiers who are their constituents in South Korea, and they're very dedicated to the alliance relationship and have great respect for the South Korean authorities, especially in the Ministry of National Defense and the armed forces in Korea. So I think um, Trump is, again, caught up in the context of the United States' interests, which are very uh, substantially invested. Uh, I would as a personal preference, I would love to see, see us have not so many forces in the Persian Gulf and a lot more forces out here because the, the threat is rising here, not in the Persian Gulf, in my view. Uh, but that, that's uh, something that has to be sorted out as we go through this important transition from the period when we could sort of unilaterally conduct wars against Iraq and Afghanistan and then ISIS to dealing with a world where China can be a much more formidable contender if we lose control of the situation and end up in combat. If I can add a little bit to that, that question assumes Kim Jong-un would ask for it. And that isn't, for me, that is not a auto, you know, assumption, that, it, that may not be a valid assumption. And, and, and to me, Kim Jong-un will hesitate before asking for that because, number one, he has his own worries regarding China. And, 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 and there is this narrative, which I don't know whether I buy into it, that uh, uh, Kim Il-sung had told Carter that he wanted a uh, continued uh, U.S. presence on the Korean Peninsula. Same with uh, Kim Jong-il had told Kim Dae-jung that he wanted a U.S. presence. So that, so that premise, that assumption that Kim Jong-un would ask for it to me is a questionable uh, assumption. Second thing I would say is that even if you were asked, I would say it is to me very, very unlikely that Trump would agree to that because he will know that's a very, very valuable card which should not be played, you know, quickly or easily, you know. 
じゃあそれではどうぞあじゃあそちら先で。Hey, I'm the bureau chief of the South Korean newspaper, Joseon Ilbo. It's great to see you, Ambassador Yoon, to see you. Well, uh, after I was assigned here last year, June, I found there is a sharp contrast between、uh, South Korea and Japan.、Uh, I found that the alliance between South Korea and United States is getting worse, but the alliance between、uh, Japan and the、uh, United States is getting better. Uh, for example, very recently,、uh, Japanese government, government decided to vote a small island to let the、uh, United States to use the island as the field exercise. But South Korea、uh, abandoned all of the exercise with the United States. So, my、uh, question is、uh, Is there any possibility that for President Trump, Uh, to uh, uh, give up or、uh, loosen the alliance with South Korea while strengthening the alliance with Japan.、Okay. Uh, I, I, I think I'm going to question again the premise of that question a little bit. I agree with you, the relations between South Korea and Japan are getting bad. You know? That's very regrettable. I agree with you on that. I do not necessarily agree with you that、uh, alliance relationship between South Korea and U.S. are getting worse. I don't know where, why you would draw that conclusion.、Uh, you know, after all, you've seen very close joint approach to North Korea. You've seen the degree of coordination、uh, between South Korea and North Korea. And really the idea to suspend Uh, joint uh, exercise, U.S. ROK joint military exercise. Whether you like it or not, South Korean government is supporting it, you know? So, so again,、uh, I question the premise. Uh, regarding, uh, uh, and, and then the third one I agree with you, which is the Japan、uh, U.S. alliance relationship is getting better. All right, next question on this side. I am an international relations professor at Ningyo University. A question goes to Mr. Paul. Thank you very much for your presentation.、Um, I think today's discussion very much focused on the regional crisis. Please allow me to nudge the direction of the discussion to a broad context. And as a, The North Korean nuclear crisis、uh, should have two dimensions. One is a regional crisis, nuclear. Another one is an NPT problem as well. So,、um, how do you think about NPT and a military、uh, disarmament、uh, process? And we are already、uh, witness, witnessing that、uh, this process has been stagnating for quite a long time. And uh, uh, the, this, uh, the dis disarmament process is a harbinger of the major power relationship. As a, not, currently, I'm working on a book manuscript on, the, on this. So,、um, how do you think、uh, U.S. Japan alliance can do something to push this process to play an intellectual or moral leading role、uh, to push this process? And this question also goes to our two Japanese speakers. And Japan is a victim. Of the nuclear bombing, it's possible for Japan to play. As we today we talk about the title is Japan US alliance relations, where it's being focused on the military side of the leadership. Is it possible to play、uh, intellectual and moral leadership as well? Thank you very much. <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss to answer your question.、Um, A few years ago, a friend of mine, just before he passed away, had been one of the original authors of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. And he said to me it had been a great success because at the time when the treaty was being drafted,、uh, there was an expectation that 30 or 35 countries would have broken through the nuclear barrier. But that in final analysis, it's only a handful who have done it. And he He felt that we ought to give an honorable state funeral to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and, and renegotiate something more fitting to the new world that we're in. I, I'm not an expert on this area. I, I don't have thoughts beyond that. But I think that the,、um, uh, the current atmosphere、uh, is, 
is not conducive to much progress on this subject. I think we're going to have to work on a more case-by-case, issue-by-issue basis rather than trying to reach large and overarching agreements in a period when major powers are drifting apart and are not close to coming to consensus on many issues. If you can't get the major powers together, a new replacement for the NPT will be very difficult to find. Thank you. Any comments from the Japanese speakers? North Korea, can it be denuclearized or not? When I talked about this overseas, many countries, panelists, says that uh, is Japan going to be nuclearized? That's what normally happens in the rest of the world. But for Japanese people, because we were attacked by a bomb, well, it's not an emotional issue only. We have to be logical. NPT regime is contributing more to the security and stability of Japan. So withdrawing from NPT would be such a big disadvantage to the Japanese security. Japan would not uh, 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 make such a choice, I always answer, and the Japanese government uh, feels the same way. Hi. So, uh, Maya says. In Meyer, uh, National Defense University, Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I agree about the, with you about the importance of the Japanese-American alliance. It's very strong and very important. But Mr. Paul mentioned he would like to see a transfer of some American forces from the Middle East to this region. What responsibility does Japan have to increase its own military capability to protect the waters around Japan? That question is for anyone who wants it. (laughs) From Japanese side, Ono-san. If you look at the National uh, Defense Program uh, guideline, clearly there's a difference from the past. One of those differences is that Japan wants to defend itself with its own power, and uh, this power will be strengthened. As you rightly said, Japan, if it can have uh, enough power to defend itself, then uh, the Japan-U.S. alliance will be more effective, and uh, the same thing can be applied to self-defense forces. There's uh, constraints by uh, the constitutions. There are some missing links uh, in uh, capability. When I was in active duty, I didn't say this, but after retiring, uh, exclusive defensive defense is much talked about. To an excessive degree, if Japan, well, Japan has restrained its military uh, capability uh, in the past, which has relaxed now. Enemy uh, just wants to exploit our weaknesses. If Japan says that we cannot do this and that, and the enemy would attack that, but precisely attack those points, we need to overcome these weaknesses for Japanese society, for the Japanese security. Those are indispensable. For the time being, the Japanese government is heading toward that direction, in my view. Well, I'll be happy to, since I was mentioned in this, um, uh, the allocation of American forces to Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Persian Gulf, to me, seems uh, inappropriate to the situation in the Middle East generally. And it's diverting resources that we are now short of in the Asia-Pacific region. And I would point particularly to the Navy and Air Force as opposed to ground forces. You will be familiar with the fact that we've had two major collisions of um, important ships, Aegis-class destroyers, in the last year in this region. This has been attributed in a number of reports to uh, extended tours of duty beyond the normal that reduce maintenance and reduce training. And those are all signs that we were undermanning and under under supporting our forces in the region. That would just keep us standing still, not even moving 
toward uh, higher levels of capability in the region. And I think we, we need to address that, especially as we watch uh, China rapidly moving up the ladder of production of capabilities and training of their people. Um, we still have a big advantage, but to keep that advantage, we have to invest in it. Right, we uh, going beyond our schedule time. Uh, do we have any further questions? If not, I would like to conclude this meeting as of this. But uh, I'd like to ask you to give our panelists a big round of applause.